fiction I wrote about when I was a young man in the 70s when I knew Roy. It was a mixture of the young and promising, as he then was, and the people who'd grown up in the slum and been through the war. Not a perfect political generation, but they were a remarkable generation. They were good, deeply rooted people. And they, now this isn't an argument for a slump and a war to give us a better political class, but the ones I wrote about in the mid-70s, in terribly difficult times for this country, were very, very substantial indeed. And I was spoilt. Willie Whitelaw made the same point, actually. Um, he gave an interview to Woman's Own in 88, when he had to retire through ill health. My subscription had lapsed, so somebody had to send it to me. <laughs> and he made that point that the big division in politics is not left and right, wet or dry. It's the generation that were in the slum, lived through the, grew up in the slum and were in the war, and those who were not. And not just on the battlefields, home front, all of that. And there was a, a fibre, I don't want to romanticise them, but there was a fibre to that generation. And they were fascinating people. And there's a danger now that because I'm not getting at my friend Jack Straw, whom I admire greatly uh, by saying this, but there's a, there's a danger that those who've come up through being special advisors or working in these rather odd consultancies and think tanks, never having a job uh, that requires them to use evidence as the main determinant of what they do, or mixing more widely, that they come right through as if in a sealed railway carriage, almost risen without trace. And they're only happy in their own company, and they then acquire spads who reinforce that weather system. And it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that when I first wrote about it. I was all in favour of special advisors. I think they were limited to two in your time. And if you had good ones, that's all you needed. Um, and if you recruited them on the basis of special gifts, not just because they reinforced your prejudices, all to the better. Although, Maurice Peston, to whom Roy and I are devoted, has told this story publicly. Maurice, Professor of Economics, wonderful man, was asked by your permanent secretary, what's your function, Professor Peston, as Secretary of State's special advisor? And Maurice said, my function is to give spurious intellectual justification to the prejudices of my Secretary of State. <laughs> But of course, Morris saying it, it wasn't true. But it's classic Morris, that, isn't it? Um, so that's what worries me, really. Also, um, in the 1980s, when the two parties polarised, it was very difficult for people in that political generation who <clears throat> might otherwise have thought of a career in politics once they'd cracked a bit of a profession to go in. Because the two political parties in the 80s, particularly in 83, to, to many, were taking ideological away days. I mean, the 1983 Labour manifesto is, Roy carries it on his heart, don't you? That dreadful manifesto. <laughs> and it would be very difficult for people to be able to sign up to that, even if they were naturally centre-left. At least I thought that at the time. So I think in my age group, the polarisation of the 80s meant that quite a lot of people who would have helped the country didn't begin to put in for the losable seats, let alone the winnable ones. I don't know if Roy would agree with that. And that is the problem. Um, also, the cumulative power of celebritocracy and soundbitery means that um, it's, it's ever more narrow. It's narrower spectrum in which you operate. Um, tell me, am I wrong about this? If Boris was called Eric and had brown hair, <laughs> would we be so preoccupied by would he be where he is today? Probably he would. He's a gifted man and interesting. I don't know. But I think it's a generational problem because I probably, I'm not saying you're prejudiced, I certainly am, but we, our instincts may be the same on this. But you see, Clem, Clem Attlee, my one political hero, Clem wouldn't get through any selection process now, would he? Because the answers would be monosyllabic. If you did an interview with Attlee, transcript, the questions are like that, and the answers like that. My favourite is the... Um, Granada Television interview with him in 67, just before he died. And the interviewer said, Mr. Attlee, on the 26th of July 1945, when you realised Labour had won the election, you must have felt as Mr. Churchill felt in May 1940 that you were walking with destiny. Never had much idea of destiny. But surely, Mr. Attlee, you know, taking over the majority for the first time, all the problems of the world. No, 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 never saw myself in heroic terms. Absolutely wonderful. Now, can you imagine Claire? Uh, they'd be saying, how will he play in the local media, let alone the national? And Clem Attlee, a man of conspicuous virtue, is unimaginable today because he had all the charisma and presence of a journal. <laughs> and as Douglas Jay said of him once, he'd never used one syllable 
and where none would do. <laughs> and I also, the world is different. You know, the, Attlee had a great cardinal virtue, I think, that he was loyal to every institution he'd ever belonged to. It's a very attractive characteristic. He was loyal to Haleybury, the Imperial Service College. I think he was trained to be a district commissioner of the Empire, and he regarded Britain as his district, really. I mean, it's very high-minded. So he was loyal to Haleybury, uh, loyal to University College Oxford, loyal to the British Army, where he'd been Major Attlee in Mesopotamia, and loyal to the Labour Party and the trade union movement. And he wouldn't have a word said against any of them. And I think that was cardinal virtue. But there again, but he's inconceivable now. Uh, I think even if there was such a character around, he or she wouldn't make it. So I, I am worried, I have to say. And um, it's a terrible life, though. The relentless pressure of media, uh, the 24 hours. In, in the mid 70s, it was different. Jim Callum was very good, actually, at rationing out his appearances as Prime Minister. He was never uh, rushed into the studio to rebut. The idea of a permanent rebuttal machine would have been very alien to Jim. And he did ration himself out, and he had a calming effect. Harold, of course, was rather more obsessed with the media, if I can put it tactfully. But uh, it's the degree to which the politicians have allowed the pacemakers in the press to govern their own ruling metabolisms. And when New Labour came in, I found it a toe curling government for many reasons, lack of self irony being one of them. Um, in some quarters, they felt the need to win the argument by the world at one if somebody had got at them successfully on the Today programme. Well, that's a short term, that's a sure road to mania, and it always ends in tears. What were the other two questions? Sorry, I've got wandering away. There were well, two other thoughts. I just wondered if you could list three qualities of a good leader. Yes. List three, three qualities, qualities of a good leader. Yes. What would you put as number one? Yes. Um, a necessary humility the higher you get up the ladder. There's a danger when you climb the ladder of inhaling your own career and of thinking because the system has made you where you are, there's not much wrong with the system or other people's judgments are pretty... And unless you've got people around you and wife and children to say piss off, you know, like the Monsignor in front of the Pope, seek transit Gloria Mundi, flicking little bits of earth, in metaphoric speaking, the Holy Father, you're in trouble. So you need a kind of necessary humility. Allied to that is self-irony. But above all, you need judgment. And judgment comes from a variety of things, one of which, and I would say this wouldn't die, is a sense of history. Because as John Buchan put it in his um, memoir, John Buchan of the 39 Steps, in the cycle in which we live, we can only see a fraction of the curve. And the job of the historian is to try and describe the curve as best we can up to the point where we now are. That's the justification for contemporary history. Roy was talking about that. But unless you've got a sense of that, you can get easily carried away. And you become, Brian McGee had a good phrase for it, provincial in time, present centred. And I remember somebody who worked in number 10 for more than one prime minister saying to me that when an unexpected event breaks, the first version you get, even in number 10 with all its information flows, is very rarely anywhere near the real picture. So if you react too quickly, you can build in distortions. And that's even more tempting now because of the wretched tweeting. Why is it that so many MPs uh, collapse into tittishness, uh, retrospective tittishness, by feeling the need to react to something that they've only just seen on the tapes, or that's old fashioned phrase, on, on 24 hour news? And there's a tremendous temptation there. So it's a kind of necessary detachment with a gyroscopic effect from knowing a good deal of history and also an empathy for those wider than your own tribe. I've added another one. I think they are the indispensable ingredients. But above all, do not inhale your own career. That's the number one, I think. Yes, lady here, and then to you. With all the media kerfuffle about the selection of an MP in Falkirk, it seemed to me they were overlooking what the unions have actually been trying to do, which is to put more ordinary people in Parliament who've had experience of life, whether it's profession or, or working jobs, 
And I wonder whether you have any ideas about how this can be successfully done so that we, and I think it's one of the key questions for why people are no longer interested in politics, because politicians do, on both sides, do look like clones. Yes. Um, I would use the example of this constituency, not my own, which, which actually had an open primary. Yes, and what do you think about that idea? The doctor. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the problems, what I would do, because you can't legislate for this, but they come in very early now nearly all of them. There's a feeling that if you want to be a cabinet minister, you've got to be in by the time you're 33. Now, great people have come in very early. I mean, we all know what the um, Rowan Atkinson's pit the embryo, don't we? <laughs> pit the young, do you remember that wonderful sketch? So I'm not against, but it, it, if the parties were better at encouraging people to come in when they cracked a trade or a profession or a craft, i.e. in their early 40s, with still a chance of preferment, that would increase the number of people who've done other things. Michael Howard, I think, didn't get into the Commons unusually till he was just about 40, having been a QC. And um, he rose very high and fast, which is terrific. But the, there's, a, there's a kind of market amongst the young and politically ambitious. And they all have a notion of where the main trail to preferment lies. And it very, it's much less so now through trade union, through profession, through craft. And that's what I would worry me. But again, I won't react to Falkirk because I only know what I read in the newspapers. But if indeed people have been put on party membership lists who haven't been invited, you didn't know they were, I mean, it's prima facie, it doesn't look too good. So that's not the way to do it. But the impulse is absolutely right. Absolutely right. Yes, the question here. influence of the civil service in uh, whether a whether it's changed and b where does it fit in do you think to yes. your your uh, description of the current state of the well i'm worried about this relationship between ministers and civil servants not all of them but francis Morley who's a friend of mine wants ministers to have much more of a say in the top choices of who the officials are and i'm a believer in the notion of crown service as a transferable public service from one administration to another which is the great 19th century notion, Gladstone, all that, Northcote Trevelyan. Profound believer in that, and in the armed services and in the intelligence world. Because if, for example, this set of ministers persuaded the Prime Minister that they really should have the overwhelming say in the choice of the Permanent Secretary from a slate of names put up, uh, another Secretary of State for the same party might not see the Permanent Secretary in the same light, and Labour will come in again at some point and say, we wouldn't have done this, but these are Conservative approved people in the way they never were before, I'm not sure we can work with them. And we will have gone through a one-way valve and we will have lost it, this great tradition. Because I don't think Crown servants can fulfil their primary indispensable, indispensable function of speaking truth unto power unless they are chosen, not on the beauty of their political beliefs or the empathy for one party or another, but because they know things and can say, come on a minute, it's not that straightforward. And the reason why it's got to this pass is that the civil service is much diminished, been bashed around a lot, and it's not, in, it's not the confident body that I used to report when I was young. And nor are ministers for brim brimming with self-confidence. And our model of the governing marriage only works if you've got two very self-confident professions who know they're in in indispensable to each other and are prepared to speak truth under power both ways. And if it begins to falter, you get into mutual scapegoating. If my bug in the permanent secretary's Wednesday morning meeting is still active, they're obsessed with Francis Morgan on this. They talk a little else. And it's a sign of remarkable lack of self-confidence. But it really does worry me because we could be losing it bit by bit with hardly anybody noticing. And the moment we go anywhere near to the American system, we're stuffed. Let alone, if heaven forbid, it should happen in the armed forces of the intelligence world. So I'm a 19th century boy on that. Absolutely. Gladstone, Northcote, Trevelyan, through and through. It took ages to get Northcote Trevelyan implemented. Queen Victoria hated it, resisted the idea, and the Foreign Office, who were a bit slow on these things, didn't implement it until the beginning of the last century. Um, but it's a power beyond price, our tradition of public service, I think. And um, also, you won't get the people you need signing up to do it, civil service, if it becomes a super special advisor's job at the top. Just, they just won't sign up, and we'll all be the poorer. Sometimes the relationship can be scratchy and difficult for understandable reasons, it's personalities very often. But if ministers lack self-confidence, 
they have always reached for the easy near escape go to a geography of power, the permanent staff. And it's self-deluding. The most confident ministers I've known never ever scapegoat on their civil servants, either retrospectively or at the time. But there's an awful lot of that now. And the special advisors feed it, don't they? They insinuate little unkind remarks, chit-chat. No, it's not in good shape. Oh, I really am depressing you now. Can we have one last question that's cheerful? Anyone got a cheerful question? Cheerful? Sort of. <laughs> I don't know why other people don't vote. I know why I've stopped voting. And I'm shamefully and angrily conscious that so many people fought and died for universal suffrage and yeah. to give me the vote. But I no longer feel that there are political parties with manifestos, but rather supermarkets with PR campaigns. This week, we have 500 lines that are the same as those in Tesco. That's not what I want. And you spoke about Attlee being monosyllabic, but Attlee and his contemporaries, and I feel that many who came after him, had heart. Their ideas may not have been perfect, but they had heart and a belief. And I feel that's what's lacking. And I feel ashamed of myself for no longer voting, but I feel angry with the politicians and their special advisors who treat politics, who treat democracy, who treat Westminster as a PR campaign for their own benefit and not for this country. And I think that is so wrong. I so I'm afraid it's not a cheerful question. No. It's an angry question, I'm sorry. Well, no, you're very honest. I can see why if politics seems to become a game in which the media are the commentators of, of how the game is played and who's up and who's down, that it is very disillusioning. And it cuts against what we all feel, which is a quiet, understated patriotism, that it shouldn't be like this. They are not, in a phrase beloved of Roy Jenkins, rising to the level of events. That's what a large number of people feel. Um, they are indeed patriotic people, for, for the most part. It's just that the way they conduct themselves and of course, quite often, the better end of their natures, or as President Lincoln would put it, the better angels of their nature, are terribly well concealed. For example, I concentrated a bit this morning on the comprehensive spending review, or the tribalism and the bellowing, but within two hours, some of the loudest bellowers were upstairs in select committees as entirely rational people, concentrating on heavy-duty policy analysis and scrutiny, in a way that you would approve of, I'm sure. Same people. It's, uh, it's like an old prep school, isn't it, really, at the House of Commons? Absolutely frightful behaviour in the, in the playground. And you come in, sweat a bit, calm down, and start learning, doing what you should do. But the trouble is the public, by and large, doesn't see that, unless they love the Parliament channel. They don't see all that bit. But I know, I can understand your disillusion, because they are not rising to the level to which, or they don't appear to be, to which we would want them to. And since the crash of 2008, um, it's become ever more important that they should. Not that there's any quick or easy answers to any of that, but the tone and pitch of the national conversation. If somehow, I'm finishing on a Pollyanna note again, if somehow we got somebody who was understated, self-ironic and serious in a good way, but also very funny about life, who reflected, uh, who could somehow set the pattern for a different sort of national conversation, I think we'd all be deeply, deeply happier than we are. Do you want to stand for Parliament? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Heart, yes, absolutely. I'm very glad you used the word heart, you see. We're not allowed to be emotional being Brits, are we? But we've used the word patriotism and we've used heart, and that's enough for one more.